Okay. So welcome everybody. I'm very glad to be here and uh, to bring you the greetings of the university and of the Dipartimento Economia e Statistica Cognetti de Martis where um, Walter spent, I should say, all of his academic life. Uh, actually, he was exactly in front of me, so I have a... It's, um, <clears throat> it's a... Uh, well, i <laughs> just leave it here. So, um, I am very happy of this uh, day celebrating the legacy of Walter, what I will do here is uh, to draw the attention of what he did for the department, where, as I said, he spent many years. Uh, he was a sort of uh, pioneer. Um, he was head of the department in 2001-2004, uh, and uh, he, at that period, he pioneered studies in economics of culture. So the Cognetti department was one of the first ones in Italy to have regular uh, classes in economics of culture uh, and research in, uh, in that topic. Um, it's important to remember that Walter was born as a public economist, so for him culture was a public good. Uh, whose externalities are very, very important for the shaping and the quality of society. So this has always been the way he looked at culture. Um, as I said, in the 90s, back in the 90s, we had uh, both teaching and research at the department. Uh, teaching, he obviously gave uh, lectures, gave classes in economics of culture, but it was very important to... Um, to build, a, to, to, to found a master which, exists, which still exists, which is the Master for Environment, Culture and Territory, which is a very um, successful master uh, for over 100 students a year. And then at the same time, he had a relationship with the ILO and thus uh, gave, uh, gave birth to another very important master, um, um, which is now at the 22nd uh, uh, edition in cultural heritage. So this was very important. He was important, of course, for the internalization of the department as well. And I should say that this day is, uh, um, in, in a way, uh, <clears throat> son of Balter because he had a relationship with UNESCO, which at the end uh, gave rise to this uh, uh, UNESCO Chair for Culture. Um, in the 90s, he had, uh, I'd like to, to, to draw your attention to a very important report on uh, culture, the cultural, uh, uh, cultural situation in Italy, uh, which he did with Brosio. Um, so I won't, uh, I I won't say anything more. I'll leave you to your work and so uh, all my wishes for the day. Thank you, Elisabetta. I think this works. So I'm not Luciana Lazzaretti, probably you noticed, but maybe not all of you. I'm Giovanna Segre. Uh, and so uh, I'm here and I'm taking the floor on behalf of Luciana Lazzaretti, who was supposed to introduce the workshop, within which this uh, special plenary session dedicated to celebrating Walter Sant'Agata's legacy is hosted. So we are opening actually a workshop with this plenary session. Uh, of course, <laughs> since you see me, uh, Luciana Lazzaretti had an impediment, and so this morning is not with us, but she will arrive in the afternoon for the parallel session, and she will be here tomorrow, the whole day. Uh, so let me just mention that this workshop that is called Rethinking Culture and Creativity was founded by Professor Lazzaretti in 2019 at the University of Florence. Then, uh, um, at that time, the organizers, together with the Professor Lazzaretti, were Tiziana Cuccia from the University of Catania, Pierluigi Sacco, at that time, at the Ulm University of Milan, Ludovico Solima from the University of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli. Uh, the purpose of the program was, and still is, to create a network of scholars in topics related to economics and management, of culture and creativity, trying to contributing to the current debate and the emergent issues of the cultural and creative economy. So the workshop welcomes theoretical and empirical papers from academics, researchers, but also students, 
basically PhD students applying both qualitative and quantitative methodologies. We try to be as um, inclusive as possible, given the fact that the topic of culture and creativity is not a, a so widespread topic uh, in, in our uh, disciplines, economics and management. And then the COVID pandemic occurred, so there was a stop of the workshop, and the second edition um, was held in 2022, uh, organized by Mara Cerquetti from the University of Macerata. She hosted the workshop, even though it was a virtual workshop, <laughs> everybody was online, almost everybody was online, few people came to Macerata, and she joined the organizing committee, and Mara is here with us today. And during this second edition of the workshop, I was invited by the organizers, the organizers to be part of the committee. Uh, and I was asked to host the third edition of the workshop at the University of Turin. And this is the reason you are here. Uh, and so, of course, after consulting um, with my colleague Enrico Bertacchini, who organized the workshop together with me, uh, and also with the Sant'Agata Foundation, uh, we decided to accept this uh, task. Um, and so we decided also to take the opportunity uh, to remember Walter Sant'Agata. Uh, in this sense, uh, in a while, I will pass the floor to Paola Borrione, president of the Sant'Agata Foundation for the Economic of Culture. But before, uh, I would like just to remind you that uh, uh, this morning is organized in uh, three sessions. This session is a greeting and welcoming for all of you. Then there, was, there will be the real first session moderated by Professor Gianmaria Iani from the University of Turin, a good friend of Walter. Uh, we will have Francesco Bandarin on the T's online because of a problem in the airport in Paris yesterday that you probably understand which could have been. Um, and uh, uh, Christian Barrer in the first session. Uh, then we will have a coffee break. And a second session, I will moderate the second session with Perjan Bengozi uh, and David Trosby. And then there will be time to discuss and remember Walter together, open to the public, and you will be free to say in Italian or in English um, if you want to say some words. And the final greetings by Silvana Santero, which is the president, honorary president of the Sant'Agata Foundation and the wife of Walter. So I give the floor to Paola. Thank you, Giovanna, and thank you all to be here. Um, before giving the floor to Professor Barrer, uh, Bandarin Bengozi and Trosby, who honor us with their presence and uh, their remembrance of Walter, I would like to briefly tell you about the path that uh, Fondazione um, had done uh, over these years. Uh, Fondazione was established with the intention of continuing and expanding and strengthening the work that we had started um, as young researchers at the time with Walter and uh, within the CSS Ebla Study Centers uh, dedicated to Silvia. Giovanna Segre and Enrico Bertacchini, uh, with whom Walter has shared the last productive years of work, are continuing his work within the University of Turin, and I thank them very much for this and for the spirit of collaboration that connects our organization. Uh, from our side, two are the legs uh, Walter taught us to walk on. Uh, culture as an opportunity of, for dialogue among people and development for communities, and young people as energies to be fostered and grown. He himself uh, was a, an example of this in his commitment uh, uh, not only to academia, but al also uh, supporting the many concrete local and international initiatives to work on heritage and contemporary cultural production as a spark for development, and in his uh, great uh, generosity to share those experiences uh, with the younger researchers. Uh, we work following these lessons, uh, the strategy, training, and support projects in Italy and abroad, just to mention some of the most recent ones, range from the management plan of the World Heritage Site of uh, Pompeii Ercolano, uh, o Plonti in Terra Annunziata, to the strategic plan for sustainable tourism uh, of the Eolan Highland, from the Creative Europe Impact Study in Italy uh, for the Ministry of Culture, uh, to the feasibility management plan for the former Spach uh, prison in Albania, 
uh, to the work in uh, Saudi Arabia, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Turkey, in the Balkans. Uh, we have led and are leading in uh, recent years. Um, the bag that you received uh, at the entrance, for example, is from a Syrian artist collective uh, and uh, is the result uh, of a project to foster dialogue with cultural organization in Syria that we carried out uh, this summer, thanks to the collaboration with the Musei Reali, and which has precisely um, the sense of continuing the work that Walter started more than 20 years ago, working on the Damascus citadels uh, as a part of the Italian cooperation, international cooperation. We tried to extend and consolidate the international networks that we have started building with uh, Walter, reaching a total of more than 40 official partnerships, including uh, university, research centers, UN organizations, and NGOs in the cultural field in uh, 11 countries. Uh, this year, we were indicated by the Italian Ministry of Culture as one of the two Italian representatives in the G20 networks of institutions engaged in the field of uh, uh, training in heritage uh, management, uh, um, of cultural heritage management. And uh, in addition, in November, we will join the General Conference of UNESCO in Paris where we have been already officially informed that we be appointed as one of the 33 foundations all over the world and trusted to have the status of official relation with UNESCO, a list which includes a prestigious organization like the World's Monument Fund and the WWF, for example. Uh, in the same way as Walter, we try to give a great space to young people. Thus, some uh, independent training programs were born such as uh, Heritage Beyond Walls, uh, dedicated to Syrian students, uh, YES program for young people and sustainability, the summer school in post-conflict recovery in partnership with ICROM, and the participation in a master program organized by University of Turin and other universities. Uh, but above all, we try to give space in the foundation day-to-day -day life to younger people, having a large majority of researchers under 35, not me, uh, we work with uh, passion and commitment. And uh, in uh, 2018, when the foundation got established, uh, we were five. And now we are more than 20, based in Italy and abroad. So thank you to you all, in particular to Alessio, who is the Fondazione Secretary General, and share with me the responsibility of leading the foundation. In addition, for the past several years, we have been giving some scholarship to encourage the attendance to the master program in World Heritage and Cultural Project for Development of the University of Turin, which was funded by, the, by Walter. And this year, we started also a fundraising campaign, thanks to the support of Banca Intesa for funding platform, to strengthen the resources uh, available for the purpose. And to this aim, a special fund has been established, named ABLA, to remember. Uh, Walter's Law for Eva Village in Syria, uh, specifically intended to give scholarship to young researchers and practitioners coming from countries facing uh, conflicts or humanitarian crises. So the commitment to try to expand the work started with Walter is bearing his first fruit, but our greeters thanks uh, uh, go to him because we feel, as the philosopher says, that we are sitting on the shoulder of giants and that's why we can see far. Uh, a final heartfelt thank you from us all to Silvana, who support us, who trust us by allowing us to remember Walter and Silvia through the foundation, um, who inspire us uh, to always continue to do our best. So thank you and have a good conference and I think we can leave the floor to Yeah, Professor before Ayala. leaving the floor, I would like just to draw your attention. Uh, to the fact that, uh, of course, there will be, after this uh, important session, um, break for lunch. And at 2.30, uh, at the third floor, we will give you again the information later on, but at the third floor, uh, there will be uh, the, um, there are the two parallel sessions from 2.30 to 6 uh, in the afternoon and also tomorrow morning, again in the morning, there will be two parallel sessions in the, at the third floor. And then there is a special um, plenary session organized by Professor Bertacchini together with Wikimedia, Ita Wikimedia Italia. Hmm? 
you will explain better, um, about unlocking value from digital heritage collections, international perspective. So there is another plenary session tomorrow in the afternoon that is open to the participant to the workshop. And so now uh, I think we can, we should immediately move on uh, to give the floor to the next speaker and to Professor Ayani. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Good morning to Francesco Bandarin, who is online, and to Professor Christian Barrer. Uh, I will be uh, chairing this uh, session, um, and uh, I will. I I hope you will be forgive me if I take just two minutes to tell you what um, the experience of having met uh, Walter was to me, because Giovanna <coughs> mentioned me as a, a good friend of, uh, of uh, Walter, which is absolutely true. Uh, it was a, a, a friendship born in the, the academy. My field is comparative law, and um, comparativists in law have a kind of special um, destiny, which is to be curious. We don't have a specific matter to study, and so we can navigate all over uh, social sciences. And that led me to uh, meet Professor Santagata uh, many years ago, I think 20, 25 years ago, uh, when we uh, started to discuss a project which was uh, the starting up of a PhD program on law institutions and, economy, and economics. Um, or institutions, economics, and law, which is in fact the correct uh, formulation of that, which is still alive as a PhD. Uh, the venture was really fantastic because by the time it was uh, around 2004, 2005, uh, to set up an international PhD program was more than a nightmare because you had to face all possible um, prohibition and details in the administrative a regime of um, um, PhD programs in Italy, but we succeeded. And uh, so that is something I would like to remember because that uh, program was uh, designed together with uh, Jean-Pierre Bengozi, who is with us today, meaning also Ecole Polytechnique de Paris, uh, with the Cornell University, and uh, with other institutions that joined the three by the time faculties, economics, Cognetti, um, or, or department, economics, Cognetti, uh, law, and, um, and political sciences. Um, the focus was also on what was uh, dear to Walter, which is studies in economics of culture. I'd also like to mention Enrico Bertacchini, who was a who is a former student of that program. And so we made, thanks to the energy put into the effort by Walter, I think a good program, a good success that produced uh, younger colleagues uh, in many different academies in the world. Um, through that, and I'm almost done, uh, Walter also brought me to understand more and more the relevance of uh, legal institutions in the management of culture. And in fact, uh, I, I would say, and I like to say that because of that, I moved from my classical field, which was more law and development, into law and culture. And in fact, today I teach art and law at the same department where, in fact, Walter was uh, teaching. So what is good to be a senior professor, um, as I am, as, uh, as Walter would have been, uh, is that you can reconnect all these uh, red tapes 
uh, and personal, personal links who not only originated friendship but also uh, made possible to <laughs> new projects and institutions to sort out. So that was my very personal contribution to the memory of Walter and uh, I'm thinking uh, all those who organized that, I don't think there is a need to, 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 to stress that is the day to, to remember Walter because as I tried to, to tell you, uh, he is in our daily practice of teaching and researching, uh, at least of those who many work in the field of um, economics of culture. So thank you so much for your patience. Now we go <clears throat> into the session. Uh, I, I was told that um, contributors have about 20 minutes each, uh, and the first one to speak is uh, Francesco Bandarin, who, is, um, direct, who has been director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center from 2000 to 2010, and then assistant director general of UNESCO for culture between 2010 and 2018, and last but not least, advisor to Fondazione Sant'Agata. Uh, Francesco, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. And um, first of all, I would like to uh, apologize for not being uh, there, um, although I had tried all I could <laughs> to, to make it. But I was a victim of the disorder of the world, of our contemporary world. And when I arrived at the airport, there was a, yesterday there was a, a bomb alarm. Actually, I found out that Ten uh, airports in France had the same uh, problem, and uh, so my my uh, desire to to come to Turin and share this occasion with you just vanished, and uh, I had to stay almost ten hours in this uh, stupid airport uh, just waiting to be <laughs> freed. But <by him. laughs> and so it was a very very sad uh, conclusion of my thing. But uh, you know, um, but believe me, I, I am there with you, uh, uh, really in every possible way because. Uh, first of all, for my affection with the, to 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 Walter in summary, you know, Walter has been a, you know a very good friend, uh, although we met very late in life. Uh, but uh, you know, I think everybody who who has met Walter uh, cannot uh, really f forget him because he's uh, one of these persons that fills your life with ideas, uh, passions. Uh, um, creative <laughs> atmospheres, as he was uh, always saying. Um, and of course, you know, in, in my uh, professional work, I had many opportunities to uh, share and exchange with him um, and learn actually from him you know, many, many things that are, uh, were very, very important in the transitions, the transition that UNESCO was uh, managing uh, at that time. There was about, uh, I would say, uh, 20 years ago, maybe when you know, I took this function as a director of the World Heritage Center and then later on uh, ADG for culture at UNESCO and finding, of course, an organization that was very powerful and uh, well known and so on, but quite backward from a, uh, say, theoretical point of view. Uh, the uh, World Heritage business, which is uh, perhaps still, as of today, the most important, uh, you know, program uh, of UNESCO, from a, a, a theoretical point of view, it's really, I would say, primitive. You know, both in terms of uh, its own its own uh, uh, you know role and not as as uh, say a function in the world that is very advanced and very and very uh, um, say important because it, you know it, it somehow it determines uh, policy making and uh, somehow it creates also a myth you know for for this cultural uh, sector. But in terms of, in, in, in the way in which it represents itself and it knows itself, yeah, for instance, uh, just to give you an idea, and I think our friends there know very well, there are very few data on, economic data on the impacts and effects of uh, World Heritage descriptions. And so we are quite blind in, uh, uh, on the results, effects of what uh, we do. Um, we were discussing this with uh, with Walter, and of course, you know, the situation as now is a little improved, but not not much. A little improved because there are many uh, good researchers. Some of them, are, of course, uh, there with you today, Professor Begozi or David Trosby, of course, who was one of the originators of the you know, theory of economic theory of, of culture, and and of course the uh, the this legion of younger. 
uh, research that uh, Walter was able to uh, to create and encourage in the, in the in the profession. But if you look at the you know what's um, done at UNESCO, it was very little uh, in reality. To uh, to we always suffer for this lack of information, data, and uh, you know analysis of the economic impact of uh, of, uh, of our actions because we were managing a very important pro program and that was completely say, blind in terms of uh, and and when we tried a few times to you know, understand it we you know, ran into very many difficulties because of course you know we're dealing with a very large uh, asset uh, large series, uh, array of situations and and and, and uh, very difficult to to integrate into a, a coherent uh, set of analysis but um, when Walter uh, uh, came into our, you know, radar, uh, we understood that many new things that could be uh, could be could be very useful, uh, in spite of the lack of information and data, to understand uh, and even in, in understand the role of heritage and also inform, you know, the public and even the member states of you know, what was the um, the potential uh, impact of. Uh, uh, of, of culture and cultural heritage you know, on, on their own uh, well-being, on the economic culture, on the economy of communities and so on. Uh, I think there was a very interesting click, I would say, in, in, at UNESCO and Walter was really the, the one that understood this, uh, um, this moment and uh, somehow helped also in the development uh, of tools you know, to, to to make it uh, you know, effective, when the 2005 convention, the convention for the um, for the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions, uh, which are you know, very different from world heritage, but at the same, but is part of the same family of uh, uh, convention that UNESCO manages, was adopted in, to, in 2005. This convention, which by the way became one of the most uh, ratified, you know, very quickly ratified by. Uh, many, many member states, including the European Union, which is a very unusual uh, uh, characteristic of this convention, because normally international treaties are reserved to member states, but in this case, you know, the European Union was admitted to to be one of the members, and that made a big difference, uh, both in terms of uh, finances and, and, and scope of the entire the convention. Um, and this convention focuses on the issue of development. Uh, somehow, of course, uh, maybe in a sort of traditional way, interprets and, and, and uh, uh, culture as a, also a, a, an economic product. But certainly it was uh, more important for a rethinking of the role of culture in, in, in sustainable development. And sustainable development was, uh, you know, the talk of the town at that time, you know, from 2005, roughly, to 2015, uh, we had you know, a, a, a real transition in the U United Nations uh, world uh, in, in terms of uh, the use of, uh, of many um, or many programs and the, and the orientation of many programs that we were uh, running. Um, when, of course, the uh, preparation for the uh, 2015 Sustainable Development Goals um, was, uh, was in the match. And when you uh, want to be a part of a, a major uh, international agenda that is focused on development, uh, you have to innovate in your own uh, discussion and your discourse. And the uh, 2005 convention offered this platform. Um, of course, the, the, the 2005 convention is more focused on the, say, cultural products, so to say, so more on the uh, what we you know, call this uh, very unsatisfactory category we call intangible, you know, intangible heritage. But at the same time, we realized that, uh, you know, this could apply to also to, to our heritage. And uh, with the help of Walter and many other uh, you know, thinkers, including David, uh, because David was very much close to our colleagues that were doing this work, uh, we were able to um, not only understand and advance the discourse. And uh, if you look at you know what was uh, said after 2000, between 2005 and 2015. You realize that it has been a, almost like a you know a Copernican revolution of, <laughs> for for us as secretariat of the convention, but most of all for the member states um, who uh, never had a, an idea that world heritage and heritage protection could be a factor of uh, 
uh, of sustainable development. Uh, it may seem strange today because now, of course, we are now in a different uh, approach and a different uh, cultural sphere and so on. But I do remember very well that when uh, we had the 40th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention in 2012, so I'm not talking about it's not long, long ago, um, we were preparing you know, the, the themes for, for the celebration of the, of the uh, 40th anniversary, and my push was to uh, clearly put sustainable development up front as the new dimension of world heritage. This, uh, this seems very normal, <laughs> very almost obvious today, encounter major opposition from the member states. They will say, what are you doing? This convention, the World Heritage Convention, is not for economic development. It is for protection of World Heritage. They say, excuse me, <laughs> we are not only doing the same thing because protecting heritage is an economic uh, activity uh, and therefore has to be, but also has to be linked to the local communities. You know? And uh, in, in a way, uh, you know, this resistance was very really indicative of, uh, you know, the state of affairs at that time. Um, we uh, succeeded, I would say, in uh, pushing this, um, this uh, new approach into the uh, world heritage world. And thanks also to the other uh, conventions that have been adopted in the meantime. The, I mentioned the 2005 Convention for the Protection and, <coughs> and, and uh, of, of, of the Diversity of Cultural Expression, but also the Intangible Heritage Convention which uh, had uh, been approved uh, in 2003, maybe more in a kind of a traditional fashion. The Tangential Convention is also for just protection, they don't look at it. Because it's so linked to the life of the communities, it became inevitable to look also at the um, economic uh, dimension. Well, you know, Walter, Walter was very, very important in this uh, transition because he helped us also uh, somehow looking at heritage in different eyes, you know, and we, uh, because uh, everybody has a profession and a kind of a tra personal tradition, we look at things with their own eyes. Uh, for instance, I'm a, a more an architect and, 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 uh, and physical planner than, than, than an economist. So. Francesco? Oh. Ecco. Yep. Abbiamo perso le ultime due frasi. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. So I was saying uh, that you know he was help not he was helping us in sort of re revisiting some of our concepts. For instance, I give you two examples which are very big and perhaps uh, yet unsolved, completely unsolved. One is the partition that we make between tangible and, and intangible heritage, uh, which you know makes very little sense when you have when you consider it for as a culture as a tool for economic development it doesn't make any sense to sort of divide this and it's just it comes from a different tradition you know it comes from uh, um, the fact that uh, tangible heritage is the product of the world of uh, heritage preservation uh, that is in the past 200 years you know and so essentially uh, from the restoration of monuments to uh, the conservation of other types of, uh, of heritage. And intangible heritage is a, a product of modern anthropology. It's uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss made into you know, a, an, an international uh, convention. Somehow, you know, the, uh, the, the protection of the expression of a, a cultural expression of a community as, as a constituent, uh, you know, a dimension of their, of their culture and spiritual life. Um, uh, you know, if this separation that we have today, very strong, uh, because we have a very, very fixed <laughs> and, and uh, somehow <laughs> difficult to solve uh, separation between uh, tangible and intangible, doesn't make any sense when you have to consider culture as a factor for sustainable development. There was, and you know, I think you know, the contribution of Walter on this was very important to somehow break the walls and, and in a way also redefine uh, the, the very nature of heritage, I would say, and the nature of, a, of the object that we were you know, uh, there to, to protect. And the second one, is similar, is this uh, partition that we have, uh, again, a product of uh, perhaps a millennia of, uh, of culture between um, the cultural world and the natural world, uh, as if the two things could be separated, uh, could be dealt with separately. I think Walter was very 
important in somehow, you know, explaining to, to us and many people, you know, the fact that nature and culture are, you know, our constituents, are dimensions, that if you look at uh, them from an economic standpoint, you know, they are not very different, you know, they, they are perhaps, uh, you know, much more um, unitary, a unitary system than we, than, than we think. Because in at the end, you know, what mattered to him was to identify heritage as a, as a social expression, uh, not just as a discipline or something that could be, you know, divided and, 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 and and, and broken up, broken in pieces. So I think, uh, you know, he, he, the, the, his, one of his main contributions and his main thinking that is um, still, I think, uh, you know, there as a, as, a, as a key testimony of his uh, foresight and capacity of, uh, is the idea of the cultural district. And, and the cultural district is, you know, something that integrates all these dimensions into a, you know, a unitary a system of policies, you know. So I think uh, I'm, I'm sure that this will be discussed um, today because uh, cultural this is where, you know, his uh, main uh, say policy <laughs> conclusions. You know, you needed to somehow, you know, not only develop policy but also make and integrate all the system, the actors that are, you know, around a certain cultural or natural uh, or natural system. So it's a it's a very it was very rich to. Um, uh, rich exchange that we had with him. And of course, he, his focus was, um, you know, a lot on Italy, and I remember his uh, white book, uh, Libro Bianco, on the creativity that, and the also the art economy and, uh, and the analysis of art markets are mostly um, linked to Italy. But uh, but you know, he, he, you know, he, he, Italy has a has the uh, possibility of influencing. You know, in the heritage field, uh, many many other countries. You know, and I think now this uh, I, these ideas that he, he the idea that he pushed for forward uh, were uh, were taken up. Uh, you know, a year ago we had um, a very important conference that was organized by UNESCO in um, Mexico. It's called it was called Mondia Cult 2022. It was the first conference, uh, global conference on, on, on the culture since the other Mondia Cult conference of 1982. So there's a 40 years leap <laughs> between the two. And, you know, the, the conclusion of this conference, and I think it, this will, will bring us to a other future, in the future other dimensions, was essentially that culture is a, a cultural common, you know, and uh, this was the Key word that Walter was uh, was using when he was talking about culture. Culture is public good as a cultural common. So you know the fact that this now has percolated into the um, UN talk. I think it's it's quite a, quite an interesting result. I'm not saying, of course, that it was only uh, Walter, uh, because uh, you know, there are many people here today that have also contributed to this uh, transition. But certainly, you know, these seeds they were put in the. Uh, in the system by, by him have generated a lot of uh, new approaches and new visions on, uh, on the role of culture. Now, of course, uh, and it has been already said that Walter was, Walter was also an, an educator and <coughs> a proof is that all his, his you know, pupils are here today. Um, so he launched a lot of you know, important uh, uh, proposals for you know, new, new type of uh, uh, Training programs. Uh, um, you mentioned already the master on world heritage management. This is, uh, you know, perhaps the, it's the only uh, master in the world, and that deals with the economy of uh, world heritage, and of course with more like a practical, uh, say, approach in terms more of management. But you know, it, it is you know unique, a unique um, proposal, and it explains also its great success. I mean, when you have uh, same master going on for 22 years means that there is also a, a tradition now that has been uh, established. We worked a lot with uh, Walter and many other other people that are with us today to 
create a UNESCO center for uh, economy of culture in uh, in Turin. And of course, this is a you know a little bit a, a, a darker you know side of the story because we were not successful, unfortunately, in uh, leading this uh, very important idea of Walter to fruition. Uh, th thanks and or, or, or not thanks to uh, you know bureaucracy, Italian bureaucracies, especially you know uh, at the central level that somehow blocked this idea once it has been approved by the by the member states because the General Conference of UNESCO had approved this uh, the creation of this center but uh, you know what we tried many times and i think the giovanna and other friends know very well to revive this idea but it, were, it was not as successful so if i <clears throat> it is uh, unfortunate because it would have been you know again at the global scale a unique um a unique uh, center for research and i can just imagine how it would have influenced uh, the life of uh, heritage internationalists but you know we have other other uh, we found other solutions we have now a unesco chair that um, somehow plays the same role, although not at the same level. So um, I, I think Walter was also inno quite an innovator in terms of research and institutional buildings, because his his word was so believable that people were really following this. And he was, you know, not only a theoretical person but also a practical, pragmatic, uh, pragmatic person that uh, you now looked at uh, issues of very high level, like government or culture and. Uh, you know the uh, the national impact on national and local economy, but also at the same time he looked at uh, uh, local, very local factors. I remember very well, for instance, my trip together to Naples, a place that he really loved because, as you know, he was a passion passionate of the presepe of uh, Naples. He wrote wrote uh, uh, many many essays on that, and also he proposed the creation of the district of. The presepe in Naples, which is, you know, a, a fantastic art expression in, in, uh, in that field, and um, and you know, visiting these places uh, with him, visiting the downtown Naples with him was really fantastic because you know, not only was he was a great scholar, but he was also a very warm, uh, funny human being that we had a lot of a lot of fun together. And he was very, very generous, as we know. I still have in my library a book that he gave me as a gift. It was actually quite a major book as the trip to Italy of the Bray. You know, it was a you know a very important edition of this book that he wanted me to have. So I anytime I, I see it and I read it I have very, very warm memories of him. So I'd like to close this with a, you know, a, a tribute to his memory. I know Silvana is with us and all the friends are with us. And since uh, 10 years, we keep saying to ourselves, you know, how important this meeting with Walter was, how would have been, you know, very, very important to have him with us in the development and in the, in the follow up of this, of the launching and the grounding of this great idea of the economy of culture. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Francesco. Uh, you, you have put very clearly how the role of experts is in uh, um, making possible a common shared platform among different cultures and different countries when a draft of an international uh, agreement or a conference is, uh, is, is uh, on the desk and how much the role of Walter was uh, in that. So uh, thanks again. The floor now goes to Professor Christian Barrer, um, who is Professor de Sciences Economiques à l'Université de Reims. Um, as I said, we have uh, largely 20 minutes for okay, your time. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. Parlerò in italiano. Ah. <laughs> Grazie. Sì. Può, gira può girare il computer così lo vedo? Sì. Bene. Yep. Ok. Buongiorno a tutti e a tutti e grazie. Grazie per avermi incluso nell'omaggio al mio collega e grande amico Walter, con cui ho lavorato nei migliori anni della mia vita e che piangerò sempre. Ho avuto la fortuna di lavorare con Walter dalla fine degli anni 90 fino alla sua morte su progetti di diversa importanza, ma siamo sempre rimasti in contatto durante tutto questo periodo. Walter era un appassionato 
fatto quando venivo a Torino per lavorare con lui sulla stesura finale di un paper e di solito eravamo già in ritardo rispetto alla deadline, appena arrivavo iniziava a elencare tutte le cose su cui dovevamo lavorare e non importava quante volte gli decise che dovevamo prima finire quello che era in ritardo, lui continuava a spiegarmi qual era la posta in gioco. E facevamo interminabili passeggiate per Torino, mi portava in giro per la città per un numero impressionante di chilometri, con brevi soste per un ristretto o un aperitivo. Ho visitato tutti i caffè di Torino e continuava a rifare il mondo della ricerca. Era entusiasta e intellettualmente curioso. Aveva il tesserino di, da giornalista e scriveva articoli per il supplemento culturale del Corriere della Sera, ma aveva anche una sensibilità davvero, davvero giornalista, capaci di intuire il nuovo, di percepire ciò che stava emergendo. Mi ricordava il detto attribuito a Lenin, secondo cui il vero politico è colui che sente crescere l'erba. E non appeva, percepiva qualcosa di nuovo, voleva capirlo, approfondirlo, tanto che per lui l'analisi economica non era una disciplina astratta e formale, ma un modo di, di capire il mondo. Un mondo di capire, ma un, un mondo reale. Lui eh, proveniva dal mondo dell'economia culturale, mentre io dal mondo dell'economia industriale istituzionale, istituzionalista. Eh, ci rendemmo subito conto che potevamo combinare questi due approcci per far luce su fenomeni che il mainstream oscurava a causa del suo pregiudizio formalista, che all'epoca era largamente dominante. Quello che ci interessava non era vedere come la realtà potesse essere approssimata a costo di semplificazioni più o meno giustificate dai modelli di mercato più o meno perfetti della teoria dominante, ma al contrario, capire perché non funzionasse esattamente come i mercati in questi modelli. Abbiamo quindi rivolto la nostra attenzione a mercati e settori che sembravano in qualche modo marginali per la teoria dominante perché non erano buone incarnazioni della teoria e in qualche modo disprezzati come l'arte, la cultura, l'abbigliamento e la moda, la gastronomia, il vino, i prodotti di lusso i prodotti locali, i prodotti del patrimonio. Come avevano già iniziato a dimostrare Ruth Tose e David Trosby, pensavamo che le caratteristiche sostanziali dei beni fossero importanti per il funzionamento dei loro mercati, che i quadri o i vestiti alla moda non fossero fatti allo stesso modo dei trattori o del filo spinato, che non fossero venduti allo stesso modo e che, per usare l'espressione di Elina Ostrom, the devil is in the details. Questo mondo era situato per noi in relazione al suo passato. Abbiamo preoccupazione a lungo termine. Walter aveva un'ampia formazione storica, 
Credo che il gusto di Silvia per la storia non è arrivata dal nulla. E Walter fu immediatamente attratto dal lavoro di Douglas Norse, come me. Norse aveva dimostrato che la differenza di crescita tra Nord e Sud America non poteva essere spiegata con una funzione di produzione, ma che tutto diventava più, più, più chiaro quando erano coinvolte le istituzioni e che queste avevano una gravità che creava dipendenze di percorso, pass dependency. E in un articolo dell'epoca, Norris ha criticato due proposizioni centrali dell'approccio economico tradizionale delle scelte razionali. That institutions do not matter and that time does not matter. E ha dichiarato It's culture that provides the key to past dependence, a term used to describe the powerful influence of the past on the present and the future. E parlava di a common cultural heritage. Noi volevamo usare lo stesso approccio per spiegare il successo della moda francese o italiana, dei vini di Bordeaux o di Piemonte, del design italiano, della gastronomia francese e così via. Tenere conto della dimensione storica dello scorrere del tempo e del suo carattere irreversibile significava anche inevitabilmente tenere conto della dimensione geografica di un'area eterogenea in relazione alle risorse locali sia in termini di fattore produttivo e materiale che di risorso culturale e istituzionale. E anche il periodo dell'analisi dei, distri dei distretti industriali della Terza Italia, delle forme cooperative di organizzazione all'interno di forme competitive, della creazione di sinergia. E Economia di prossimità basate non tanto sulla prossimità spaziale quanto su quella culturale e sociale, in gran parte legata all'esistenza di un forte patrimonio locale, come lo hanno dimostrato Arnoldo Bagnasco e Giuseppe Becatini. Walter, con la sua naturale curiosità, acuita dalla conoscenza dei previ, ma anche dei limiti della teoria economica, era aperto agli insegnamenti della, delle altre scienze sociali, in particolare della sociologia, dell'estetica, della semiologia, della geografia e della storia. Dunque, abbiamo lavorato sulla cultura come un mezzo di socializzazione e come fattore economico sulla creatività e sul patrimonio. Norse aveva già introdotto un'analisi degli effetti economici del patrimonio, mostrando la differenza degli effetti di due patrimoni, da un lato quello trasmesso dall'Inghilterra, incentrato sul mercato, e che incoraggia la ricerca del profitto attraverso l'innovazione e la riduzione dei, costo, dei costi. E dell'altro, quello trasmesso da Spagna e Portogallo, un modello burocratico che favorisce le rendite e i prelievi, e i prelievi sul produttore finale, dunque scoraggia lo forzo produttivo. Abbiamo voluto testare il potere euristico di questo approccio, studiando come economisti settori in cui la cultura e la cultura del passato hanno giocato un ruolo importante. Ne avevamo già preso coscienza studiando settori come il vino, la gastronomia e la produzione locale di beni patrimoniali, beni 
legati a un, teo, a un territorio e alla storia di una comunità e della sua cultura, de, dallo champagne alle ceramiche di Caltagirone o ai santoni di Napoli. Lo studio della moda francese ci ha permesso di esaminare il ruolo economico della cultura nei diversi periodi che ne hanno segnato l'evoluzione della moda. In primo luogo, perché la cultura è una della, delle modalità fondamentali di socializzazione. Le relazioni tra gli individui, tra gli individui e le organizzazioni e tra le organizzazioni stesse sono radicate in codici culturali condivisi che nel caso della moda, ad esempio, definiscono il modo in cui gli individui appaiono, appaiono le convenzioni che regolano il loro aspetto. Individui che, come scrisse Anna Arendt, sono individui mondani, spinti a incontrarsi, presentarsi, esibirsi e competere dal loro aspetto. La cultura ha quindi un impatto economico essenziale. Nella società di corte, organizzato intorno alle relazioni interpersonali, il sistema di etichetta ha portato a una moda, aristocrat a una moda aristocratica basata su, tessi su tessuti e ornamenti ricchi ed eseguita da artigiani ansiosi di riprodurre le routine del passato, anche un settore governato dalla dinamica della domanda. Al contrario, la moda elitaria della fine del XIX secolo si è basata sul culto della novità e dell'originalità, trasformando l'artigiano in un artista. Secondo le parole di Charles Wurz, sono un artista dell'abito. Oggi, è guidato dalle dinamiche dell'offerta e l'evoluzione culturale della moda continua a essere segnata dal passaggio alla moda di mercato con il prêt à porter e poi alla moda di massa di oggi. Lo studio di altri settori ha permesso di confermare l'analisi del binomio patrimonio-creatività come uno dei nodi essenziali del ruolo economico della cultura. Il patrimonio appare come un stock, la creatività come un flusso. Il patrimonio conserva un certo numero di risultati della cultura passata, elementi tangibili e intangibili, esse stessi prodotto della creatività passata. Si ha richiesto di nuovo creatività. Le relazioni possono portare a spirali virtuosi di sviluppo, come nel caso della moda. Il patrimonio serve come base per lo sviluppo di nuova creatività nel modo in cui gli stilisti rivisitano il passato o rompono con esso, ma possono anche portare a blocchi. Walter che probabilmente era più preoccupato, preoccupato di me di capire il mondo per poter agire, insisteva molto sui rischi di sclerosi che una gestione puramente conservativa del patrimonio poteva comportare, sacralizzando i risultati della, cre della creatività passata, a scapito della nuova creatività. E in questo tic che si è posto il compito di convincere i leader politici dell'importanza di politiche pubbliche volte a sviluppare la creatività di oggi, ad esempio con la consacrazione della creatività a Firenze nei primi anni 2000 e la stesura del libro Bianco sulla creatività, Francesco Bandarina ha già parlato di questo. Vorrei quindi concludere con, secondo me, 
secondo me, il messaggio essenziale che Walter ha lasciato ai ricercatori. Al di là dei suoi specifici contributi scientifici, per me ci ha mostrato che la curiosità che era il, al centro dell'approccio di Walter è la cosa più importante per i ricercatori e allo stesso tempo la più arricchente. Vorrei collegare questa lezione di Walter a un testo di Michel Foucault. Foucault ha scritto «Per quanto riguarda la mia motivazione, la motivazione di Foucault, era molto semplice, è la curiosità. L'unico tipo di curiosità, in ogni caso, che vale la pena di praticare con un po' di ostinazione» non quella che cerca di assimilare ciò che è opportuno conoscere, ma quella che ci permette di staccarci da noi stessi. Che valore avrebbe la perseveranza nella conoscenza se servisse solo a garantire l'acquisizione del sapere e non in qualche modo e per quanto possibile lo smarimento del conoscente. Ci sono momenti del, nella vita in cui la domanda se possiamo pensare diversamente da come pensiam, pensiamo e percepire diversamente da come vediamo è essenziale se vogliamo continuare a guardare o a pensare. Vorrei solo aggiungere che la curiosità rende felici i ricercatori, come ha dimostrato Walter, nonostante i dolori della sua vita. Nonostante ciò, Walter, che trasudava ottimismo, lo trasmetteva a chi lo circondava. E, per me, al di là del suo importante contributo scientifico, questo contributo umano è forse la cosa più importante che ci ha lasciato e per la quale possiamo ancora ringraziarlo. Grazie. Grazie al professor Barrer. Una... Abbiamo tempo per qualche breve domanda. Benissimo. Una bellissima relazione, ehm, una storia personale della storia scientifica e avremo, avrete tutti colto, ascoltando oggi, 2023, mh, quello che avete fatto a partire da, se ho capito bene, fine degli anni 90, sì. quante intuizioni c'erano in quel lavoro. Oggi noi possiamo misurare quante di quelle intuizioni si sono eh, sviluppate, hanno dato corso a, a programmi di ricerca, a programmi didattici, a interventi anche di politiche governative sui temi della cultura. Eh, abbiamo tempo, quindi... Ci saranno tempo alla fine per degli interventi, ma se qualcuno vuole porre una domanda ai relatori... Bene. Benissimo. Ladies and gentlemen. Francesco. Sono qui, se c'è qualche domanda posso rispondere, se no volevo congratularmi con il professor Carrer che ha fatto un quadro molto più preciso del mio sul contributo scientifico di Walter. Uh, and, and I hope everybody understands Italian there. Uh, <laughs> and, direi di uh, sì, a, a osservare la platea direi di sì. Okay. Nessuno ha un vocabolario in mano, ecco. <laughs> o un, telefono, in o un telefono. <laughs> Bene, allora il, il caffè prevale, allora eh, arrivederci tra poco. Grazie. 11, 11 e 5, dice Giovanna.
Grazie. Buon caffè. Grazie.
if you have one seat, <laughs> where to sit? Come on. Okay. Just to understand if <laughs> they can have a seat, there are the students of my class of cultural economics second year. They are supposed to have a seat only after everybody <laughs> has one. So I would like just to know if there are, if everybody is back. I don't know how many people is still drinking the coffee. We can. Okay, so you can sit. Don't. Yeah. So, so you can. Everybody can have a seat. Also the students. Sorry, but I was worried about other. But you are supposed to be comfortable. And also the people from the Fondazione Sant'Agata. I can have a seat and maybe we can close the door or... Okay. Okay, so welcome back to, from the coffee break to the second session of this morning. So I already spoke before and many things have already been said, including things about me, and what happened with the Category 2 Center of UNESCO and researchers and so on. Um, many things have been said about the role of Walter in our department. Uh, so let me just add that I'm very happy to be here with so many friends and colleagues uh, all together to remember Walter. So thank you all for being here and thank you in particular to the speaker of the second session, Pierre-Jean Bengozi and David Trosby. Uh, they will discuss uh, together with us about their experience in uh, working with Walter, but they are very important scholars in, in cultural economics. Uh, we start with Pierre-Jean Bengozi, professor at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, uh, who developed since the early 80s pioneering research on information technology, telecommunication, media, and culture, so he's our expert on uh, this field and in particular on creative industries, and I let you the floor, please. Okay. Okay. Fine. Well, uh, it's really with uh, great emotion that I find myself here to speak uh, about Walter here in, in Turin. The, uh, to which he was so attached in front of Silvana and all his friends. And I would like to take this opportunity to look back at the lesson I've learned from uh, working and sharing with him, both as colleague and uh, as, a, as a fine person, a mensch, I should say, in my uh, in Jewish tradition. Uh, Walter is someone, firstly, someone might be difficult to locate because as he but already be said he was a, as a crossroad of economics law political science and management and at home in every country and difficult to locate him just like the piano he loves so much and which has been so influenced by the french and the Savoyard. Uh, no coincidence that he had cho chosen a house in la mortola near the cinque terre uh, an italian enclave lost in the french territory and, uh, and interwinning of border, just like Bardonec uh, in uh, Border Town, where, where he has also had his habits. So I will speak uh, of his lesson as much as a friend, and a friend more, more than a colleague. And it was important as a formal level, the institution, the publication, as well as the informal level, the, the exchange, the discussion, and all the stimulating and inspiring discussion we had in, in various occasions. For example, but also be said by my by, by colleagues this morning, uh, it provides a new way of looking at the world where culture is always present. I remember when we went in the street of uh, Venice and just began uh, a paper 
on, on counterfeiting, looking at the peddlers selling uh, counterfeit luxury goods. Uh, it was the same thing when we uh, went to, uh, to Cyprus for UNESCO and discussed about Famagusta, but also uh, about the Orthodox Church. And of course, uh, speaking of uh, uh, contemporary art uh, <coughs> uh, and, uh, and wine in the Lange, with the discovery of the Solewit uh, chapel and uh, the, the very strange history of this, uh, of this chapel. So it's uh, important because it shows that you, we can use the personal attachment to culture to feed the <coughs> object of research. In the case, he was a painter, uh, uh, watercolors. He was a good friend of uh, Pistoletto. Uh, he was also appreciating uh, wine and food, and use this appreciation of rainy food to, to analyze, the, uh, and Christian mentioned that this morning, the economy of wine, the economy of property rights, the uh, intellectual, <coughs> the way to, to, to protect the quality and to raise the quality. He was also highly concerned with transmission. Of course, we cannot speak of uh, Fontaine Santagatas uh, without remembering Sylvia, without remembering also, the attachment he had to his name and the transmission of, of his name, uh, speaking uh, with his brothers. And uh, also, the, the importance of spreading and sharing with the student. And I think the success of the Ebla Center and of the Santag uh, Fondazione Santagata is a really a very, uh, one of the biggest success, uh, we, we could say. Unfortunately, uh, he had the opportunity to give to, to, the, to the world of culture. And this has been a way to build really key contribution to the cultural economy, covering a wide range of, uh, of specters. The cultural commons, one of the first papers dealing with the cultural commons. The, <coughs> the governance, governo della cultura. Uh, the fashion, Christian, the book with Christian Maria, and also the, 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 the Libro Bianco sulla creatività, which was also one of the first uh, white, uh, white book uh, in the world de dealing with this, this question, from fashion and design, from slow food and creative industries in, in, in general, to, but also to the visual art, uh, to the heritage, uh, to the cultural for economic development and the public policy. Uh, all doing that, remaining open to others in research, uh, working in cooperation among uh, others. He spent uh, a couple of sabbatic years in my research center, and uh, <laughs> he has aggregated a lot of people uh, in the PhD, in the ILO master degree, uh, in the uh, Institution Economic and Law PhD in uh, Moncalieri that uh, Gianni uh, mentioned this morning, and all throughout his career and jointly with other disciplines, like management, law, political science in particular. So it gives the opportunity to make him uh, a curious and brilliant researcher, as well uh, as a, a benevolent and generous teacher who gave on himself, appreciated by students and colleagues. And I was able to notice when he invited me to, to give some lecture in his classes and really appreciated the special relation he had with the students and uh, very generous also with, uh, in, the, in the everyday life. I will not <coughs> give too much example. But he was also, and I think it's a good, also a very important lesson. Academic are not only academic writing papers and making research, they are also academic entrepreneur, meaning setting up, being able to set up a research center with UNESCO, uh, establishing academic programs that have persisted, the Master Culture for Development with ILO, the PhD uh, uh, Institution Economic and Law, and other examples, has been able to develop and to, to make a public support and expertise at local, national, and international level. Uh, the Torinese Museum Project, like the, the Egyptian Museum, the Veneria Reale, for example. Uh, the International Research Center for Culture in the Emirates or at Torino, and the, the white paper I just mentioned, not speaking of the, uh, of the Ebla Center. So he was an, an entrepreneur, but also a committed uh, actor, 
setting up uh, numerous academies project with a wide range of, uh, of colleagues and linking, uh, linked with uh, national and international public institutions, the UNESCO, the Ministry of Culture in French, uh, the Ministry of Bene, uh, <coughs> Cultural in, in Italia, uh, for example. And this gave the uh, opportunity to deal and to eliminate the variety of cultural is, uh, issues that, for me, still inspire me today. The first one is uh, <coughs> the importance of design and the weights of creativity in the national economy. It's not just a buzzword, but it's really, uh, it has really been able to demonstrate that creativity is not only a, a world, another world of speaking of culture, but it's, it's another way of conceiving and, and looking at the creation, at the innovation, and at the role uh, in, in the development. The same thing for uh, how to understand the limits uh, of the intellectual, uh, intellectual property. I, I should just give a couple of examples. The first one is a paper we made on counter fighting where the, the main idea was that, in fact, a good public policy should not be to fight counter fighting at only cost, but mostly to help the innovative, creative counter fighters to shift towards the legal world and to, towards the legal economy, taking uh, and evaluating their creative value as counterfeiters in order that they create in the legal world, for example. Another example is a, is a very interesting example of, of, uh, of the protection of, of wine uh, in Barolo. And I remember the example he gave me. He said, OK, you know, Pierre Jean, some good producer of wine of Barolo prefer to go out of the appellation because uh, the medium level of Barolo is so low today that it's better for them to create their own brand and to promote their wine on, under their brand instead of under the Barolo uh, umbrella. Just uh, two, two, two examples. Another interesting point is the economic model as a central role of heritage in the economy. Uh, not only for development of tourism and attractive best, but also in order to, to, to structure the community and the local community, uh, to stimulate the local ecosystem, and to think differently of the cultural commons, of the public commons. Uh, but counter fighting, I just speak of that. The role and the place of cluster in the cultural economy, of course, we, there is some continuity between the perspective of cluster in the industrial economy, towards the perspective of cultural command, and towards the perspective of local development, considering all the stakeholders, all the actors involved in the cultural development, uh, thanks, to, thanks to culture in particular. And of course, all this has high consequence for the governance, for the public policies, for the subsidies. Because it's not, more, not anymore a question of cultural policy, it's more a question of creativity policy and cultural commons policy. And shift, with this, such a shift, the way to consider the policy is completely different. It's not anymore thinking of supporting cultural institutions, but uh, a way to support the creative actors, whether it be the artists, the producers, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, this is the, the, the impact for the practitioner, for the policymaker, can be and has been very, very, very high. And uh, of course, uh, last, last uh, issue, which is interesting, is how to think of culture as a lever for development. Uh, there is a mistake. It's not, not in a top-down approach, but in a bottom-up approach. Considering the local community, considering the local networks, in order to consolidate such networks in order to create some uh, more structural uh, activity and economic development. And of course, we can only regret that he is not here anymore to, to help us to, to, uh, to think on platforms, digital, and sustainable development, which, which are so important today in the cultural economics. So these lessons contribute for me to draw perspective for culture and, and uh, for cultural economy and management. 
Main question, which environmental, environmental change does the management have to cope with? The evolution of the technology and the distribution media, the, the evolution of the usage and the consumer attitudes. Uh, just think of tourism, people. Is it important to think of institution for tourism, for example? Uh, when people already have in their, in their uh, ta uh, pocket a smartphone giving access to TripAdvisor, to any uh, comment of any kind. So the role of the information provided by public institutions are completely different when most part of the information is given through the, the, through the social media. The cluster of the creativity, the culture as an economic lever for, development, for local development, I just mentioned that. Second important point, what are the new market structure tests and emerging? How can we think of the integration, globalization of the market and the pra cultural practice on the one hand with a differentiation of the market uh, thanks to local activity and specific local activity? How can we think of the emergence of the new economic actors supported by the digital economy and by the digital technology? How can we think of the evaluation, the new way of evaluating the cultural policy, the new way of uh, governing uh, and controlling uh, cultural institutions, etc., and how can we support new forms of cultural entrepreneurship? And last, uh, last question, of course, in terms of management and uh, in how the localization and territorial issues turn to be redesigned between this alternative from globalization on the one hand and fragmentation and localization on the other hand. There's a big tension which exists in every, in every sector. Think of the music, think of the audiovisual, where on the one hand you can have very local music, the Korean K-pop, for example, uh, and other, on the other hand, this very local uh, uh, music get access to a worldwide diffusion, billions of view for the cap up, uh, for uh, uh, gam, uh, yam yam style, and how to redesign the creative, re what and what means today in this extent the creative region and the creative cities. And lastly, it reveals, uh, of course, a complex and changing framework, not only from the managerial viewpoint, but also for the policy and for the research. Firstly, Remaining the enforcing attention for the creative resource. In France, I should say, we use the expression, je sais bien mais quand même. Je sais bien mais quand même. I know, but. I know that creativity is important, but business as usual. But we continue to do policy as, as, as it was the case before. So how to integrate this perspective and this centrality of the creativity actually in the in, in the theory, but also in the, in the policy which are implemented. How to design the new managerial framework and think of the new managerial framework vis-à-vis -vis the proliferation of the cultural goods and the creative goods in every sector. We speak of creative goods, uh, speaking of wine, speaking of food, speaking of design, speaking of everything, speaking of... Uh, uh, um, mobilier, <laughs> uh, furniture, and so on, um, garment, and so how, what does it mean? And, and of course, the question is to be how can we select and how can we identify the quality and the good uh, creation? How to, how to think of the new artistic labor force and professionalization process? Nowadays, a lot of uh, people I can interview in, in the audiovisual sector, for example, but even in the music, they say, OK, why should I spend dozens of years to learn pianoforte or to learn a violin, etc., when I, get, I can use computer in order to produce music? So the same thing, why should I learn to make movies uh, uh, spending time to learn the traditional way to make movies, etc. When, thanks to YouTube, I can make video and be becoming a millionaire uh, within uh, <laughs> some months, uh, if I'm lucky. So there is really a, a, a very important change in the way to consider the professionalization, the acquisition of skills. And of course, with the weight of, uh, of the technology. And this call for, of course, specific 
theories and, and concept and redesigning these theories of concept. What is the relation between the cultural economy and the rest of the economy? Is the cultural economy just a field of application of the traditional model of the economy? Or is it some specificity of the cultural economy? And how should we defend and support this specificity, not just providing data in order that general economists should make some papers out of the cultural sectors and then turn back to, the, to their <coughs> uh, economy as usual? Who are we speaking to as cultural economics? Are we speaking to colleagues, other economists? Are we speaking to practitioners? Are we speaking to policymakers? Are we speaking to art and cultural managers? And from this extent as well, the lessons given by Walter are very important in its capacity to speak to all of these uh, actors. How can we design and develop new digital methodology, thanks to uh, big data, thanks to data science, in which extends this new way to consider the collection of data, uh, the creation of information, can be used in order to enhance our capacity to, uh, to explain and to, and to understand the cultural economy. And from this, very important, and this is the last lesson I, I should mention, it's important to support new creative breakthrough, new conceptual audacity, and not fearing to explore new territory just as Walter said, uh, made, uh, looking at wine, looking at slow food, looking at, uh, at, at fashion, etc. This is also part of the culture. And the, the boundaries of, uh, of culture economy today are probably larger than, than the traditional boundaries, uh, considering music, literature, uh, are, uh, visual art, and heritage. So. Thank you, Walter, for your so inspiring le lessons, and thank you all for, for listening. And so thank you, Pierre-Jean, for this very rich and enriching intervention, which, uh, with which you also introduced many uh, references to management, and innovation and challenges in the cultural and creative economy field, which is another perspective which is very important for us. Um, and so now we can introduce David Trosby. David Trosby is a distinguished professor of economics at Macquarie University in Sydney, I underline in Sydney, so he just arrived from there. Uh, he is uh, internationally known and probably the best known a researcher um, in the field of cultural economics. Uh, he's known for his uh, seminal, several seminal publication on this uh, field. Uh, let me just mention the book that uh, I, use, I used to use because it's not easy to find it anymore uh, since the beginning in my classes, and it's very known, the book on the, the, as the title Economics and Culture, Cambridge University Press 2001, that was also translated in Italian and in many other languages. This book uh, is very helpful for teaching cultural economics and for understanding cultural economics. And so you associated the word economics directly with the word culture, not art, not cultural heritage, but really just simply directly culture. And that was really innovative. Uh, David has been a dear friend to all of us for over 20 years. Uh, because <laughs> I have to say that in the last 20 years, every single year, apart from the period of COVID pandemic, and then it was just a connection online, but every single year he came to Turin for three uh, or four days. And uh, of course, even today, on a, such an important day, is uh, he, um, here with us. So thank you, David, and the floor is yours. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, and uh, thank you to you and to Enrico for inviting me to this uh, occasion, which I take very seriously because I've been a long time friend of uh, Walter. Um, I, think, I often think there should be a, a prize 
for the person who's come the longest distance to attend the conference. <laughs> <laughs> and I would win every time. Um, uh, but it is, of course, a pleasure to come um, and, and also to see Silvana here uh, today. Um, I, we all have our memories of Walter, and uh, that's, everybody has their own particular memories, um, but mine go back um, about 30 years or maybe more um, to the first time that uh, Walter and I were together. Um, and that became much more uh, pointed in the time of the beginning of the master's program in cultural projects for development. Um, and as Giovanna said, I've been involved with that ever since the beginning. Um, uh, it, was, it was clearly Walter's idea when he saw a gap that needed to be filled in the um, sort of whole firmament of um, uh, cultural economics education uh, with a particular emphasis on development and a particular emphasis also on the capacity of students to be able to uh, comprehend uh, some of the economic principles uh, because most of the students who come to that are not economists and so these have to start from from the beginning um, but it's been a really very uh, significant uh, program over all of these years and that is entirely uh, due to the original concept that uh, Walter had uh, for that for that program um, uh, as Giovanna said, I've been coming all, this, all these years. Uh, in the early days that um, uh, conference was, uh, the master's program, or my contribution to it, uh, was in September, <clears throat> and that was the uh, time for the Mito Festival, the uh, Milano uh, Torino uh, Cultural Festival. It happens at that time of year. Nowadays, it, uh, the, the, the lectures that I would give come in January or February. But in those days, uh, Walter and I used to go often to concerts and to opera and, and so on. Uh, and so I have very uh, fond memories of being in Lingotto, listening to uh, music, um, which, of course, was absolutely fundamental to Walter's experience of the world. And that... Uh, Enjoyment of concerts continued when they, when uh, Walter and Silvana came to Australia, and stayed with us in uh, <clears throat> in Sydney, uh, and we went to uh, s several concerts uh, to hear music different uh, under different stars, as they say, but it's the same music and the same sort of uh, reaction to it that we that we had. Uh, I also have a memory of Walter at that time. Um, he was an artist, or he had. Uh, he, he made small paintings, and, and I remember him sitting on our veranda. We have a very uh, big veranda that looks out over trees and the river in Sydney, and, uh, and he was sitting there with his little box of watercolours and, uh, and, and doing a painting of the view. I, don't, I never saw the finished article. It's probably in amongst his uh, collected works somewhere, but he was, he, was, he, he was motivated as much by his own interest in creating art as in observing other people creating art. Um, so he leaves a very extensive legacy, which I think uh, uh, has been covered this morning in the contributions from his old friends. <clears throat> uh, what I want to do is to try to summarise um, his contribution, not an easy task because as, uh, well, particularly as Pierre Jean has just been saying, uh, he was extraordinarily wide in his um, uh, coverage of the field uh, of economics and of culture and of art and he really uh, integrated those very much in his own thinking and his own work. Uh, so it is difficult to summarise or to draw together but I have uh, tried to sort of see what, if, at, a, at a sort of um, uh, overview level, how you would characterise the work of a great scholar. It's not always easy with great scholars to be able to do this, and, uh, uh, but, I, but I've, I've tried to do that, um, to draw together some of the strands in his thinking. I think that there are two fundamental phenomena or characteristics which uh, really began uh, to inspire his work. The first was the notion of idiosyncrasy, um, the special characteristics that distinguish cultural goods. This has a very close relationship, at least in Walter's thinking and in other, others as well, 
uh, a close relationship to aesthetics um, and how one values uh, the notion of art, culture, cultural goods. Uh, and it, it does move into the area which we now call um, cultural value um, as being a, a concept of value which uh, extends the notion of value which, is, uh, which has um, been part of economics for uh, 200 years. Um, and now I think it's crystallised much more clearly in the fact that um, the two, the duality, if you like, of the value of cultural goods or cultural phenomena generally, uh, the duality comes from the fact that there's a partly commercial and a partly non-commercial aspect to culture. The commercial aspect is picked up in the uh, standard economic models uh, and particularly in the whole uh, neoclassical uh, apparatus of economics. Uh, where value is, is uh, very much associated with monetary value and, and, and measurable in terms of price. Uh, and that's contrasted, I think, very directly with the notion of cultural value. These are, of course, these are very closely related, but they're not the same thing. And the notion of cultural value being a non-monetary, I don't mean um, intangible because uh, there are a lot of intangible um, economic uh, values which we try to measure in various ways, the value of public goods, for example. But, um, but uh, when we make the distinction, and Walter was very uh, acutely aware of this, uh, that the notion of cultural value meaning non-monetary, a value which can't really be expressed sensibly in monetary terms, and yet it's important to people and it affects their decision making. Um, and therefore it should be of interest to us as economists. The neoclassical economists have difficulty with this because if it, it doesn't really fit very easily into the uh, neoclassical paradigm. And so um, a part of Walter's work has been to question that paradigm and to uh, extend the notion of value beyond the, the narrow limits of the market economy and the uh, uh, and associated um, neoliberal um, interpretations of the world and to think much more in terms of the non-monetary um, aspects, both of individual value and also of collective value, uh, the way in which we value things as a society, um, the, the, the values which we can't necessarily reduce to financial terms. And, uh, and, and that was something, I think, which was um, very important. It was, it, it's also associated or has been talked about in the context of semiotics, uh, particularly a, a very nice paper that uh, Walter wrote with uh, Christian Barrer about um, the semiotic uh, interpretation of cultural goods and cultural phenomena. Um, and that uh, uh, is, uh, and that notion of trying to distinguish cultural goods from, from other goods in, in the economy uh, still persist today. Uh, if you only have to look at the arguments which still go on in the World Trade Organization about de defining cultural goods for the cultural exception in trading arrangements, uh, this started off with the GATT, of course, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, back at the in, in the original days, back in the 1940s. But it's still relevant to to uh, uh, World Trade Organization discussions now as to whether culture should be set to set aside because of this notion of special characteristics and a special value. So that's that notion of idiosyncrasy uh, that was that was I think one of the, the fundamental uh, building blocks of Walter's thinking. And the other, which has also been mentioned, of course, today, is the notion of creativity as 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 it were the driver of idiosyncrasy. It's, a, it's creativity which thinks outside the square, which thinks in innovative and dynamic terms, uh, and it, creativity is, if you like, the sort of engine that makes this, um, uh, brings this idiosyncratic notion about culture into, into being. Uh, and this is something which uh, Walter was very interested in, specifically in the notion of aesthetic and uh, an artistic creativity as distinct from uh, scientific creativity. He was, he was, which isn't to say that he wasn't uh, concerned about, about that, but he was mostly focused with um, aesthetic and cultural creativity. And that sort of extended into a number of questions that he asked. Why do artists create art? What's, uh, what's the reason why artists do what they do? Um, and, and, and how do collective cultures 
grow and change, is there a creative element in the way in which cultures, uh, whether they're national cultures or religious cultures or any other form of culture which connects a group together, how do these, how do these relate to the notion of creativity and creativity as being a driver of the way in which they, uh, they evolve? Um, <clears throat> so with these two sort of fundamental phenomena underpinning most of Walter's work, I'll just mention, it's very hard to summarise uh, his work because, and, and Pierre Jean did rather a nice job about that because uh, um, he, he covered a lot of the field. I've just brought together four different areas which encompass the sorts of things that those two basic um, uh, phenomena underpin and, 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 and then led to the sorts of uh, work that Walter did. Um, the first is uh, systems of cultural production. How is art produced and consumed? Uh, he saw this in terms originally of industry economics, uh, but, with the which, but with the specific characteristics of the goods which, uh, which are produced. And so the notion, I mean, partly this uh, is reflected in his book on the culture factory, the notion of production, how, does, how, does, how do people do things and make things uh, that have this, these characteristics, um, uh, who, who exercise their creativity to, to create these idiosyncratic uh, goods. Um, why, why do artists do it? Why do other people do it? So there's this whole notion of the way in which culture is organised, um, because whether we like it or not, that happens. Um, culture, cultural activities are not just sort of random processes that happen in a sort of vacuum, there is a way in which it, um, culture, cultural production gets organised and that requires systems of <coughs> classification and systems of, of uh, definition <coughs> which, uh, which Walter was engaged in. So that's the first one, the systems of cultural production. And the second is um, the spatial organisation of culture. Uh, particularly localization, but the uh, the relationship between the local and the aggregate or the collective um, was something, uh, and this led to his really seminal work on cultural districts. It's become a it's become a, a concept which is now very much associated with the Taranasi group uh, working here at the university over all of these years, um, and. Um, and, and in fact, this goes back quite a long time because when I think of the, uh, when, Gid when Victor Ginsberg and I would, were putting together the first um, volume of the Handbook of the Economics of Art and Culture, a research-based um, collection back in 2006, that's a, a long time ago, um, when we were thinking of uh, who to write and what, what they should write about or be invited to write about, we thought, of course, of Walter as uh, a person to write about cultural districts. At that time, the, that notion of the spatial organisation of production uh, and, and uh, realisation of culture was, very, was, was quite prominent in his own work and in the way in which his work was having an impact on, on the profession at large. And so Walter produced that uh, paper, which, is, which still, I think, remains one of the best uh, uh, papers about, if you want to know what the, uh, uh, the concept of cultural districts as developed here in Turin, um, what that's all about, then that's a, that's a very useful paper to read. And that extended from that into a number of, of, of aspects or dimensions. Uh, the, the, the notion of the cultural commons, which uh, is now very much more uh, prominent in the way people think about these things, uh, and creative atmosphere. This is work particularly which Walter did in association with Giovanna Segre and also with um, Enrico Bertaccini, uh, some, some really path-breaking papers on these areas with a lot of original thinking. And these, I think these are the sorts of characteristics that Walter really uh, produced in people, stimulated people to think uh, originally and, and, and produce that sort, of, that sort of work. Thirdly, I think um, broadening out into a broader sort of canvas is the notion of cultural development and sustainability. How does, how, how does that, all of that that Walter was talking about, how does that get, in, get placed in, as it were, a sort of dynamic 
growth context. It's nothing, nothing, it wasn't static. The notion of, of the spatial organisation of, of culture is something that you could regard as being given and, and fixed, but it's not like that at all, and Walter saw this very much as a process where, uh, where uh, things change um, without being too specific about what that means. Um, he, he very much saw this in his own work, uh, and particularly the, the, the interrelationships between culture and the economy, which remains still a contested area in our profession, and I don't uh, uh, think we'll ever quite uh, find the bridge of the gap between those things, um, but that was, that was something which, which, for him, it was very much grounded in the notion of local development, um, the, the, the organisation of production and the changing nature of production and consumption of culture. Uh, and this was particularly in the development context. Uh, that, was, um, that was something which uh, uh, informed a lot of his, not just his theoretical work, but also his, uh, his practical application as well. Uh, and so that, in turn, leads to the broader concept of sustainability. How does, how does the question of cultural development and local development uh, and the economic development of, of, of local societies, cultures and communities, how does that get in, uh, uh, sort of even more broadly integrated with the, with the larger holistic models of the way in which development happens? And this is the, the concept of sustainability and, and holistic models which bring in uh, which, which imagine the world as a, as a holistic system where all of these different components are interacting and you can't just take the economy out or the culture out and look at them as if they're, as, as if they're independent of everything else. And the environment, of course, is what has, has particularly motivated the questions of sustainability. <laughs> And finally, the, 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 the other area that he was interested in, as, uh, as Pierre Jean mentioned, was cultural policy in the broadest sense. Uh, it was never far from his interests because he thought, he, he, it's hard to describe, he, he had a lot of theoretical um, ideas uh, which were very significant and important, but uh, there was also at the end of the day a question of what, well, what's the point? What's this going? To, is this just an intellectual exercise, or how are we going to translate this into into the sorts of things that people do or want to do? And that was where this has a, a sort of in, uh, interaction with uh, uh, with with cultural policy, and so he was particularly interested in the, the notion of of public policy, um, the notion that policy exists um, in the collective. And again, this is something where he moves apart to some extent at least from the sort of more standard economic models um, to think in terms of, of the collective uh, and um, the ways in which that is, um, uh, that is important. And, and, uh, the, uh, and this also informed, of course, his work on heritage because heritage was a sort of amalgamation of the collective um, uh, desires and interests and capacities of, uh, of, of past uh, civilizations, uh, right up to the present, of course. And so one of the things which he was always a, a aware of, uh, which often his, uh, heritage uh, experts aren't always aware of, that is that heritage is just going on. It's not something that's uh, necessarily ancient, it's uh, contemporary. Uh, contemporary heritage is just as uh, significant, and that was uh, something that he was very interested in. So Walter's uh, contribution continues uh, to be felt, and there's not many um, scholars that you can say that about, uh, that their work, is, and it's particularly reflected in the work here uh, in uh, Torino, um, which goes on and just grows from strength to strength. Walter would be absolutely delighted, I'm sure, at the, sort, at the expansion in the sorts of projects which are now supported by the Fondazione. Um, and uh, it's all in line with, exa with exactly the, the sorts of things that he, was, um, he, he would have loved to have seen happen. I, I'll just conclude because um, uh, Giovanna asked me if I would say a few things uh, about cultural economics more broadly, about where it's going. This is really quite difficult to do because um, we stand at a time now where cultural economics has emerged, as it were, from the shadows of, of being just a sort of specialist interest on the corners of, of economics, and um, or maybe not even in there uh, as part of economics. And, um, and it is true now that we do have 
and have had for uh, 30 years. Oh, when, it was 1994 was when, when the American Economic Association created the new um, category for uh, cultural economics in the hierarchy of, uh, of um, areas of uh, apply, theoretical and applied economics and gave, gave us a, uh, a letter. We have letter Z right down the end of the alphabet, so not terribly important in that sense, I suppose, but, uh, but still it's there. And, and the amount of literature which, is, uh, ca which can be classified under that category uh, which has itself become a little more specific over the years, uh, the amount of literature in that area is, has, has grown a lot. So, so cultural economics is, um, and, and the thing that always um, uh, intrigues me and uh, impresses me so much about the conferences of the Association for Cultural Economics International, which uh, happen every couple of years, as you would know, um, the thing that always impresses me about that is how many younger scholars uh, are there. I, I can say that because I'm not a young scholar myself anymore, um, but it is true to say, say that uh, there are, uh, it's, it's really interesting. See, and these uh, many people, I'm sure there are plenty in this room, uh, who are very well equipped with the methodologies and techniques of, uh, of economic analysis, but are just intrigued and interested in the broader concepts which uh, are much more interesting than interest rates and uh, financial instruments and so on, the usual thing that, or not the usual, but things that economists often get, get involved in, which uh, pretty boring. But uh, cult culture is, uh, culture and art, of course, is something pretty fundamental to the way we live, and, uh, and, and I think that's the thing. So look, uh, just to say a couple of um, uh, areas where I think that there are some really interesting um, developments going on. One is the digital economy. I think that's, that pervades so much of what we do in our lives in general, and it's certainly true in the area of cultural economics, and so there's been, been increasing numbers of, of contributions to the way in which the digital economy affects artists, uh, the way it affects consumption, and this has been given a big boost in, uh, in, uh, during COVID, and how it affects institutions. Um, I think in, 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 if you look at COVID and the way in which the digital economy did affect the operations of museums and galleries and so on, um, I think what happened there was it just accelerated. It, uh, there was things were happening already uh, over quite some time. Uh, and it's just uh, the fact that people couldn't go to galleries or museums for a period of time, the fact that this um, it was um, uh, that the digital uh, access and creation was uh, possible had a, a real boost during that time. Uh, the second area I'd say particularly is to come back to this notion of idiosyncrasy. I think the question of value still remains pretty fundamental in the, uh, thing, the work that we do in cultural economics, and it's, it doesn't long before we're up against, if we're in, in any sense of assessment or, or um, uh, estimation of impact and all these sorts of things which people do, it isn't very long before, if you're, starting to, if you're thinking about cultural phenomena, that you have to think about value and you have to start thinking in these terms. And we're not there yet. There's a lot of assessment measurement issues that are still to be resolved in relation to um, the value of cultural goods um, and cultural activities and cultural phenomena. Uh, it's not, it's not, there's been a lot of progress, I'd have to say, um, uh, and we're a lot further down the track, but it's a long track and we're not, um, and it's still one that's very interesting for uh, scholars to, um, to investigate. Um, the third area that I'd, I'd point to particularly is the structure of the cultural economy. Uh, the cultural industries are still something which uh, gets people uh, um, outside of the field a little bit upset because uh, particularly artists who don't like being thought of as an industry, and, uh, and yet the whole notion of the way in which the cultural sector integrates with and reacts to the rest of the economy. I think uh, some of the statistical work that's been going on there has been very useful. Um, cultural satellite accounts, for example, which are starting to um, be understood a bit more clearly uh, and, and available a little bit, little bit more widely. Um, labour markets uh, in the, in, and the way these work in the economy, this has been a long-standing um, interest of mine and it's been a long-standing area of, uh, of uh, interest in, in cultural economics generally and there's still a, a lot of questions there that's still to be uh, resolved and a lot of data to be collected. Um, and also the notion of, of culture 
as a capital asset. This is, kind of, this is the notion of cultural capital, which uh, is uh, there's an interesting uh, big project on heritage going on at the moment in the United Kingdom, uh, where this notion of heritage as cultural capital is being investigated in, a, in a quite a large new research project, which is only just getting underway. And I think that's something which, when we're talking about the relationship between culture and economics uh, and economists uh, and policy, uh, the notion of culture as an asset is something which talks to people in the Treasury and the finance departments and so on. So, so that's uh, another area where there's a lot of work going on at the moment, but there's still a lot more to be done. And then finally, the, the broader questions that I mentioned uh, in relation to Walter's work, cultural development, sustainability, uh, the sustainable development goals, um, which uh, it was very disappointing to many people that culture didn't feature very strongly in the development of the uh, sustainable development in the generation of the new set of sustainable development goals in 2015. There'll be, a, there'll be another round of that, uh, it's amazing how quickly time flies, in uh, 2030. Uh, and I think uh, the cultural sector will be better prepared this time to be able to argue a case for how, um, how culture should be taken on board in the notion of uh, sustainable development broadly, as I was saying before. And I think this was something which, which was very much part of Walter's own uh, contribution. So there's work to be done there, and there's uh, still a lot of... A lot of PhD theses to be written, um, but it's very nice to, uh, uh, to see so, so many uh, people continuing to work. And I'd just conclude by saying that, that there has been so, such a wide influence of Walter's work, uh, it's been uh, a privilege to be able to uh, be a, a very dear friend of, uh, of Walter and, and Silvada over all these years, and, uh, and, and I'm, it's been so nice that we've had this occasion to, to remember him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I took notes about the next papers. I wrote down everything, and we are ready to <coughs> work on that. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, we can conclude this session. And, and we have uh, the time now, because we didn't invite so many people to speak. We just selected four, um, uh, for many reasons, four names to be involved as a speaker. Um, but of course, uh, if some of you wants to say something, to remember Walter to say something in English, in Italian, in French, this moment is a, a moment that is open to everybody. And uh, I would like to invite then Enrico to come here, not to speak, but to take the, <laughs> the floor with me. Uh, but we don't have another chair. Stand up. Okay, you can stand up. We have right. a mic here for intervention uh, uh, if you want in the in the room. <coughs> there. Those two is always yeah. Yeah. No, I would like well just one thing to take the chance. I I didn't speak and uh, I decided to not speak, but also I want to inform of a. Uh, uh, an interesting project, a follow-up of this uh, day that we are working with and we can finally uh, tell it that, uh, as Christian was already saying, uh, uh, Walter was, a very, was also a journalist or worked as a journalist and he was a, a prolific writer in, uh, in uh, newspapers or specialized magazines in, uh, in arts and culture. And indeed, uh, uh, we finally got the, uh, the articles that Walter wrote uh, for the Giornale dell'Arte. They are uh, in Italian and uh, they date back from the 92 till to 2000, uh, 2012. So uh, a follow-up project for, from this uh, celebration day is uh, to make a book uh, collecting and curating these uh, articles and also giving opportunities uh, to people that knew Walter also to contribute to this uh, book, uh, writing some thoughts uh, and memories uh, of their experience with him. So surely we will uh, uh, follow and contact uh, many of you in order to uh, participate to this project that I think it's something that uh, even enlarge this uh, uh, day of celebration.
I met uh, Walter uh, when I was uh, the director of the Gramsci Foundation uh, in, uh, that is uh, in Turin, that is a cultural institution of this town. Uh, and uh, he proposed, uh, and I work uh, a research, uh, I worked with him and other people in this, uh, uh, to this research, uh, uh, that uh, gave me the proof of his uh, capacity to look ahead. Uh, and uh, it was a period when uh, Turing was, uh, uh, um, uh, was answering the challenge of, uh, industrial de of the industrialization uh, with uh, various policies, uh, cultural policies was one of them. Uh, we, uh, the, the cultural city you see today was uh, in a certain way invented the founding there, uh, preparing uh, the Olympic Games of uh, 206. Uh, well, uh, everyone uh, was accepting the, the idea that uh, Turing was uh, an industrial Turing, not a cultural Turing. Uh, the only innovation was uh, automotive or something like that. Uh, well, uh, he proposed and, ma and, uh, uh, and made with us a research about uh, what, how many forms of innovation of culture uh, in the uh, in, in the cultural sector uh, were rising and had little visibility uh, in the town, and uh, and this was his second uh, his first uh, um, capacity to have a vision to see uh, uh, to see uh, the future. The second was that uh, everyone uh, at a uh, after some time uh, agreed that uh, distribution of culture was uh, an important thing. This was also a tradition uh, for, our, uh, for our city. Well, he looked again uh, ahead and said uh, and demonstrated with uh, empirical evidence uh, that the production of culture was uh, uh, the real thing to do and that the best distribution comes from a good production of culture. So <clears throat> I still think, uh, uh, of course, we became also friends. Uh, it is, was very easy to be a friend of Walter because he was a friend uh, with everyone who could, with, which, with uh, whom who could share uh, thoughts uh, and uh, experiences. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, this was uh, a very important contribution for our town, uh, for the development of our town, of uh, Walter uh, to build uh, a public opinion uh, more favorable, more up-to-date uh, with the role of, uh, that culture can have for local development. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, I just want to say something that is very important for me. I was I met uh, Walter as a um, student in the second edition of the ILO master course. It wasn't yet a master. And I want to remember it as a student. Now it's uh, 20 years passed away, but uh, um, that is was his intellectual generosity and the capacity of uh, creating groups among his students and young researchers. And I think this is uh, very special and something very um, not so easy to find also in the academic world, to find somebody, a real maestro, a magister, that uh, takes people together and shares ideas with great generosity and puts them together to work together with a um, common goal, an intellectual common goal, uh, and uh, avoiding also uh, bad uh, competition among uh, young researchers. And I think that so we all became friends also with uh, the colleagues. Uh, so um, I want to remember this because I think it's something that really changed my life. Also because after that course, <laughs> I started studying <coughs> cultural economics and I was doing another job when I, was, when I met uh, Walter. So I want to remember this and I always remember this. Thank you. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, just a small thought. Um, I'm an economist working on migration since a long time. When I arrived in Torino, I met Walter. And Walter was a very open-minded person. It was very easy to discuss with him, much more than with many other colleagues. And um, I was always interested in culture, but you see, uh, culture is for you that you work in the field is a simple word, but for not people working in the field, has so many uh, dimensions that is very difficult uh, to have clear idea. And um, so I was speaking with him, and um, we just, uh, the last time that I spoke with him, we were uh, deciding in September to see at the beginning of the academic year, to sit down and try to see what we could do together. And unfortunately, he was no more there. And I was very happy that he put me in contact with his group. So many years later, I worked with uh, Enrico uh, Giovanna on this field. Uh, but uh, he was very open mind. It was easy to about different uh, connection with uh, this word uh, that is uh, so polyedric, uh, so many dimensions, cultures mean so many things for different people that is difficult to touch uh, and so on. Thank you very much. You don't have the mic. <laughs> also, question to the speaker coming from students are welcome. The students of my course and other students are and young researchers that are here didn't meet Walter, so you are not supposed to speak about him. But the cultural economics, you met cultural economics, and you have two um, so distinguished scholars here that you may take the occasion. We have a Till some like 15 minutes before moving for lunch. Please. Thank you. So I use this occasion to ask a question to the speakers. Um, I did not have a chance to study with Walter, but I did have a chance to follow the lessons of Professor Thorsby. So <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, uh, I was thinking, as all of you spoke this morning, uh, that I think Walter drove in Italy a big innovation within the field of economics by establishing cultural economics as a like standalone, standalone field where both academic research and research in practice uh, was to be recognized. Uh, is there a risk, do you think, um, nowadays, now that culture is... Uh, as now that cultural economics is recognized as a field, to lose the curiosity and interdisciplinarity that draws so much of the discoveries of the past 30 years? <laughs> you can start. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, so a large question and broadening context, as <laughs> we say. Uh, for me, uh, I just gave some elements previously. Uh, I think there is some paradox in the situation of cultural economy today. Um, I should see the same thing for management. Uh, more and more, the, uh, the rest of the economy is looking at the cultural sector as a laboratory for the transformation, for the dynamic. If you look to the transformation supported by, <coughs> by, digi by, by digitization, for example, most part of the new business model like free uh, sus uh, subscription and so, has been experimented in the cultural sector before being extending to the rest of the economy. The question of property rights, the question reason now with uh, artificial intelligence regarding the, the, the right over the data and in which extent can you use the data, the common data, in order to, to train the artificial intelligence. Such kind of questions are firstly investigated in the cultural sector and tested in the cultural sector and then extended in the rest of the economy. So the cultural economists have a lot to say to the rest of the, of the economists or the rest of the management science. But on the other hand, as I said, there is some paradoxical situation where it's uh, <coughs> it's really a difficulty to to make to 
identify it as a specific uh, subsector, but also because culture is everywhere. So why shouldn't we consider every kind of acti economic activity as a cultural activity? I was speaking uh, of furniture, Christian spoke of, of garment, and uh, the, comp the way to, to design the computer. Creativity is everywhere. So in some extent, the cultural economy or the creative economy is everywhere, and why should it be uh, distinctive from the, the rest of the economy, from the rest of the, of the academic field? And this is some kind of paradox and some kind of difficulty, which are at least experimented in the way to, to promote some uh, specific view, because at the end of the day, I'm supporting, but uh, uh, David as well, and all the colleagues as well, there is some specificity not only in the cultural value, but also in the cultural perspective of economy. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's, it is an interesting question, and, and I'd agree with uh, what Pierre-Jean said about it. Um, uh, there's another example, perhaps, of where uh, leadership of people working in cultural economics has um, sort of been in the forefront of work in the economics more generally, and that would be in relation to workers, art, uh, creative workers and artistic workers as uh, uh, the types of um, careers that they develop in the gig economy. And the gig economy has now become such a sort of significant part of the ways in which uh, we think about uh, development in uh, labour markets. And, uh, and it is true to say, I think, that artists were the originators of, 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 or not so much the originators, but in the forefront of developing different uh, ways of having a portfolio career, with, uh, which is the sort of um, now become much more common in the uh, in the gig economy, in the in the economy more generally. And I also think that's that's true to say that there is a widening of uh, understanding about. Uh, uh, the interactions between what we regard as culture, how, however that's, uh, that's understood. And it's true that it, within, within cultural economics there's been much more uh, development in, in, in fields which are like furniture, like wine, like, like, like food and so on, because they are very direct uh, representations of culture. Um, and you can see there that, the, the, that whatever, if you have a definition of culture which includes this notion of um, the idiosyncrasy, uh, which is still comes back to this sort of notion of, uh, of what it's about, uh, there may be a widening of interest in this uh, in economics and also in the, in the community more generally. I mean, I, <coughs> excuse me, I do get uh, surprised by the fact that there is so, so much of what happens in the world at large is driven by culture or cultural difference. And cultural difference is something we don't talk about very often, but it's, uh, it's certainly true. And if you look at some of the conflicts that are happening as we speak around the world, you can see that, that, that the roots of these uh, um, phenomena, which are uh, often dreadful and, and, and appalling, uh, there's, uh, there's a sort of, it could be traced back to a notion about cultural beliefs. And that's something which, uh, you know, as far as UNESCO is concerned, that always says um, culture is beautiful and, and fine. That's, of course, culture is beautiful. Uh, the negative side of culture is, often isn't talked about. And I think there's something to be said there that, about, that the economists could say about how um, often this gets linked up with economic disadvantage, for example. Um, and how that drives what happens. That's a, that's a pretty broad answer to your question, but, but I think it's... Uh, I, I, just, I'll just say one more thing about Italy and, and cultural economics. One of the things which I didn't mention and, and where Walter did play a very significant role is in developing the notion of a specifically Italian view of cultural economics. That's, that's sort of... One shouldn't perhaps be talking in such sort of regional nationalistic terms, but I think it's probably true in the way in which... Uh, cultural economics is pursued in this country um, has a distinctive characteristic in the various uh, locations where it happens here in Turin, in, in Venezia, in Catania, um, 
uh, and so on. You know, these are these are quite sort of specific locations where people have worked and have developed a, a, a way of looking at uh, at, at cultural economics uh, with a particularly Italian flavour. And I think that's been something which is part of the the global notion of of the of, of or the international notion of, of cultural economics. It, Italy has a has a, a probably a more distinctive uh, national position than some other. Some other countries. I think it's to the to the great credit of the people who have worked here, and Walter was very much instrumental in that. There's no question about that. <clears throat> Other curiosity from the youngest. Everything is clear, coherent with what <laughs> I have explained in the class. <laughs> yes. Please. Thank you. I had a. I can just talk without it. I feel more comfortable. I think <laughs> everyone hears me. Yeah. Ah, okay. We are on streaming. Okay, because my my voice is very loud, so it <laughs> becomes. Okay, uh, you touched on uh, like several uh, very interesting uh, directions for a research agenda in cultural economics, like uh, idiosyncrasy, digitalization, uh, atmospheres, and, and so on. And also talked about uh, the, the role of uh, semiosis and semiology in these. Uh, that is something I'm moving on in my research, uh, which shifted uh, way more on to sociological approaches, uh, like leaving maybe uh, economics a bit uh, apart. So I was curious if you can uh, deepen a little bit maybe the most interesting work that used this entry point to understand the dynamics uh, you, you said, I mean, semiology and semiosis. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a difficult question. Actually, maybe this is a, a question more appropriately uh, for Christian to uh, uh, to answer, since he's done a lot, a lot of work on semiotics, and uh, uh, you might you might be able to make a comment on that. I mean, I think it's a, it is an interesting question, and and how much uh, in the more in the broader field of, of of sociology, where that where those connections happen. Um, when we're talking about so, uh, when I'm talking about value, um, for example. Example, we talk about economic value and cultural value. There's a very good argument for saying that we should also think of social value and that that's the notion of the sort of collective value which is attributable to communities and societies and, and things like, like we understand um, uh, social value to be in economics, um, that is, um, you know, trust and uh, networks and that sort of thing. But that also has a lot of interactions with the notion of culture, doesn't it? And so I think that's um, that, that's that's something which uh, does give an entry point into that area. And of course, then there's a whole lot of very interesting theory um, in philosophy and in, in uh, sociology, which can be mobilised to think a lot more deeply about those sorts of things. But maybe uh, I don't know whether I don't want to put you on the spot, Christian. But uh, this is this is your uh, specialisation. <laughs> No, thanks. Uh, I agree with you, but I prefer add a new point to the program of the cultural economics, because uh, I think that uh, we are in the crisis of uh, the, the paradigm of modernity. If we accept the diagnostic of ecological economics, today we are uh, under a great acceleration of the Anthropocene uh, period. And uh, we are at the limits, I, I think, we are at the limits of the paradigm of modernity. Descartes, Kant, Nietzsche uh, put the man in the center of the world and of the universe, in place of God or in place of, of God. And it's uh, a, a kind of paradigm of paranoia, the uh, the of, of the man. And... Uh, Descartes said, uh, I have the, the quotation, fare dell'uomo 
il padrone e il possessore della natura. Vuol dire che l'uomo è, è vero, uh, the man is really the center of all. And the economist use the same way. They consider nature as a scarce resource, as an economic resource, and uh, as an input for a kind of uh, production function of humanity. And there is no possible to continue in this way because we, we, we saw that uh, ecological uh, regulations are out of order today. So I think that uh, today cultural economics have to cooperate with a kind of natural economics we have to build. And so we have to, to surpass this paradigm of modernity, which, which is out. Uh, we have to, to consider a new paradigm. I think some people talk about postmodernity. I, I think that postmodernity is the the way to, to, to put out the, the modernity paradigm and to consider not only the man, but uh, all, for instance, in France, uh, a French philosopher, Bruno Latour, said that we, we have to consider aside the individuals, new actors, he said that quasi-actors, for example, uh, a river, a forest, uh, il po, un fiume. So, uh, are new actors, and they have to be represented in the public <coughs> choices as human individuals. It's a new way to, to understand the, the role of the man in the universe and to, to consider. And, and I think that we have to integrate this preoccupation in the cultural economics. And the, yeah. If I, oh. Um, maybe I'll just respond to Christian right away. I'm really happy to hear this uh, uh, proposition. In the Netherlands, in the Erasmus University, we're working with the concept of inclusive prosperity. And the idea is fashion is at the center, food as well, which are uh, very much culturally driven and they touch quite a number of sectors and they have quite an environmental impact. And the idea then to have uh, cultural economies talk with um, environmental economies sounds really nice. We hadn't done that. But we're starting very much from economics and cultural economics. But I think um, much comes also from the uh, work before in the discussion of uh, sustainability of culture, which is based on environmental sustainability. Um, so yeah, I thank you very much for that proposal. In fact, if I should just add a word, <coughs> uh, I think that probably it's one of the high and biggest stake faced by the cultural economy today, by the cultural institution today, <coughs> to address this question of sustainability. So I, I just will take a couple of examples. When we speak of, local, of cultural, culture for local development, that means in some extent that, local, that culture is used for tourist attractivity and touristic attractivity. That means that people come, that means that people come using uh, transportation, using planes, using uh, <laughs> everything. So it's structurally, it questions the very uh, capacity to develop some kind of sustainable development if you are looking for attracting people for other countries. It's the same thing for the big festival or big event. Big event, of course we can use uh, paper uh, or uh, um, 
wooden uh, wooden co uh, forks and, and, and knife, etc., to eat, etc. But at the end of the day, the, the large event means that people come massively in order to, to, to look at uh, some, some groups and some music group or something. So that means that the, there is the, the cost from sustainable viewpoint is very high. Does it mean that if we go to sustainable culture, we don't organize anymore any kind of festival or big event? This is why culture is really structurally questioned by this, by this aspect. And the way to address the question today in a large part of cultural institution is just margin, completely marginalistic. Okay, I will use, uh, as I said, a wooden fork instead of plastic fork. I will reduce uh, the paper, but at the end of the day, the big thing is really questioning what are we doing in culture and cultural industry today. And this question is unsolved for, for now. I'm taking a lot of notes, as you <laughs> So, if there are no more questions and comments, I will leave the floor to Silvana. She wants to say something. So, Silvana is la moglie di Walter, la presidente onoraria della Fondazione Sant'Agata. Um, abbiamo pensato, e lei ci ha chiesto di concludere questa mattinata con qualche parola al microfono, seduta con quello col gelato, con questo, vieni qua. Sì. È la prima volta per me, quindi <ride> abbiate pazienza. Comunque due parole per concludere. Volevo innanzitutto ringraziare il Rettore per il suo intervento i relatori che poi comunque nel tempo sono diventati amici della famiglia con cui abbiamo fatto viaggi, soggiorni in Francia, in Australia, come ha ricordato il professor Trosby, e soprattutto però eh, gli organizzatori che io definirei gli ex alunni, gli ex allievi di Walter, che negli anni hanno dimostrato veramente di trarre profitto delle sue lezioni, delle sue ricerche e, cosa ancora più importante, hanno fatto e continuano a mettere in pratica la, la sua opera. Ecco. E direi che in questi tempi perigliosi non è poco questo, è veramente un grosso regalo per me. E dopodiché, come mi hanno fatto notare eh, durante la pausa caffè, eh, non, eh, non era chiaro nell'ambito familiare degli amici quanto fosse stimato Walter nel suo lavoro, cioè aveva un altro lato, ecco. E devo dire che in 42 anni di matrimonio io ho sempre goduto dei viaggi, delle amicizie, Insomma, tutto quello che era piacevole, ma soprattutto anche della sua, del suo amore per l'arte, perché lui ha sempre, da sempre, quindi già da giovane, e prima ancora di diventare professore, ha, ha sempre disegnato, ha, disegn ehm, faceva gli acquerelli più che gli oli. Poi ha cominciato anche con i quadri a olio. Comunque in ogni viaggio, dato che lui viaggiava sempre, partiva sempre con la scatoletta nera degli acquerelli, l'album, infatti io ne ho una pila di album con tutti i suoi acquerelli, cioè, contrariamente a quello che si fa oggi, che si scattano i servi e le foto, io ho gli acquerelli. Devo dire che, come ricordi, sono molto più soddisfacenti. E quindi mi rimane questo. Ecco. Però per lui era un modo di scaricare la tensione del lavoro e nello stesso tempo di ricordare tutti i viaggi e le persone che incontrava. E quindi, insomma, è andata benissimo così. Concludo dicendo che probabilmente vedendo quello che è successo stamattina in questo momento sta sorridendo sotto all'ombra del suo faggio giapponese. Grazie.
Okay. I think it's better to go for lunch now. Uh, okay, so the lunch, I'm not very prepared about the lunch. So <laughs> I, I need help from the Sant'Agata Foundation. The, the lunch is in a place that is called Off Topic, and this is clear to me as well. But how do we get the people there? We make a line all together. There will be someone that you can follow. I guess there are people just arrived for the workshop, so maybe we wait for five minutes before leaving. It's, you no, know, it's, it's too early. Hmm? Maybe we can meet in 10 minutes here in front of the door outside. So you have time to breathe. So we can meet in front of the door just outside here in 10 minutes and we go together for lunch and then we come together, but we, we learn the, the way. Uh, for the parallel session in the afternoon, as I told you, at the third floor at 2.30, okay? And uh, just add one thing, but since uh, the event was uh, broadcasted from the university media uh, website, some of you in the first row possibly will be asked to sign the um, privacy and data because they were just uh, uh, <laughs> now shown. Possibly, yes, we are collecting. Ah, Alicia okay, is Alicia is collecting the just signatures. To inform that we uh, will ask. To, it's not a check. Some of you the signature, but just for uh, these, uh, to, to allow for the registration to be. Okay, thank you to thank everybody. You very much again.